Spring beauty trends are here. At Walgreens, we'll help you create the look that's right for you. Pick up your trusted favorites in cosmetics, skincare, and hair care and explore new, premium, and exclusive beauty products you'll love too. If you have any questions, just ask one of our specially trained beauty consultants in select stores. Stop by Walgreens and find what makes you feel beautiful. Walgreens, trusted since 1901. Hair care items are buy one, get one half off, mix and match through May 5th with card. Exclusions apply. Revolution Radio Media Group here in New York, and you can call us in right now at 929-477-3997. Again, beloved, that is 929-477-3997. Now, if you live outside uh, of the continental United States of America, you can call us in right now at 1-929-477-3997. Again, beloved, that is 1-929-477-3997. Seven three nine nine seven. We are nationally syndicated through the Talk America Radio Network out of Dallas, Texas. Now, beloved, the Talk America Radio Network is indeed the new dominant force in conservative talk radio, and we are also nationally and internationally syndicated through the global um, con- conglomerate media outlet through iHeart Radio Network in the iHeart. Uh, radio media group here in New York. All right, 929-477-3997. If you want to send our guests tonight any questions uh, concerning this very powerful topic that we're going to get into that I'm going to announce in the next few minutes, uh, e- begin your email questions right now at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio at Yahoo.com. Again, beloved, that is Global Spiritual uh, Revolution Radio at Yahoo.com. And again, I am so very excited. And we here at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio uh, have to say that this is a, indeed a very historical uh, in divine um, broadcast because we have with us um, one of the most powerful authors in this country and around the world, and that is uh, the Honorable uh, Pamela J. Ray. She is the author of the blockbuster book, Interview with History, The JFK Assassination. Again, beloved, Interview with History, uh, The JFK Assassination, uh, with this uh, world-renowned author, uh, Pamela J. Ray, all the way from Chicago, Illinois, uh, with James E. Files. Uh, the grassy no shooter. Um, Miss Ray, thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule 
uh, to be with us here for the first time on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. Uh, thank you for having me, and I really appreciate this opportunity to talk with you and your audience. Absolutely. This is very, very historical. Um, and for uh, a long time, it's been our prayer to try to get uh, Mr. James E. Files on our broadcast, but we have uh, his uh, fiance, and she, again, she's a powerful author of Interview with History, the JFK uh, Assassination, uh, with uh, Pamela J. Ray, and with her fiance, uh, James E. Files, the Gracie. Uh, no shooter. Before we get into um, uh, the meat of your book here tonight, Miss Ray, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and how did you uh, connect uh, with Mr. James E. Files? Um, because truly, this is very historical. Right. Um, well, it goes back a few years. Um, back in 1997. I was in my church library, and I was looking for a book about the end times, just something that the Lord would lead me to and let me know what was really going on. And I found a book called High Trees and the Assassination of John F. Kennedy, and I thought that was kind of a strange book to find in my church library. And I read it, and I took it back to the church library and um, talked to my pastor about it. And I said, hey, this, is, this isn't this is a good thing. Um this this happened back in 1963. It, basically, we had a coup d'état, and this, the people that shot their way into power basically took over our country. And and you know, this this isn't a good thing. And so he goes, well, we're not going to talk about that at church. And you know, sorry you found that book. He basically apologized for having it in there. And I said, well, it's too late now. I read it and I understand what's going on. <laughs> and um, I was also taking some uh, computer classes over at the community college, and um, we were supposed to do a report for PowerPoint, and I just did it on that subject matter because I was pretty, my eyes were open. You know, there's always a time when people's eyes get open. Well, that was back in 1997 for me. And then um, I did the PowerPoint on high trees and assassination of John F. Kennedy, what really happened. Um, that's a book by um, uh, Robert Groden. And um, so after giving my PowerPoint presentation, putting it to the uh, music, uh, Every Breath You Take by the Police, uh, the teacher just looked at me when the song and all my um, my vi vi visuals were over. Um, and he goes, well, um, I kind of left New York and the East Coast to get away from all that because this is way out in mm. Maui when I did that. And um, anyway, I got an A for the report. And... I didn't even know anything about James Files at this point. About, I don't know, maybe like six months to a year later, I was in a Blockbuster video store, and I was just waiting for somebody at the bank next door. And I was looking around just, you know, see if there's something I want to check out. And I noticed in their special interest section, down on the bottom shelf next to How to Grow Roses, there is this videotape back when we had VHS tapes, and it said, Confession of an Assassin. And I'm like, what? What's that? And it had a presidential seal on the front. And I picked it up and I looked at it and I go, wow, this guy's talking about killing the president. And it kind of matches with that book I read and did the report on. And I, I want to check this out. So I asked the person that I was waiting for at the bank, I go, do you have a Blockbuster card? And yeah. Can I get this? Um, sure. Yeah, no problem. So I took it home and I watched it and I was just totally amazed that this guy was spilling his guts and telling the real story about what happened. And at the very end of the of the um, tape, he was asked by the interviewer, he goes, um, the interviewer asked him, Are, do you believe in God? Because, you know, just all these other questions were asked. And then at the end, he was asked if he believed in God. And he kind of looked down and hemmed and hawed and said, well, I guess so. I found myself praying to him on several different occasions and, and so I'm like, wow, that guy really needs help. I've, I've been a Christian since 1982, and my total motivation for writing him was just to say, thank you for telling the truth, and if you want somebody to help encourage you about God, then, you know, I'll, I'll be your pen pal or whatever. Just 
wrote, wrote to him to say thank you. I didn't think that he would write me back. Um, he did write me back. Later he told me when he felt the letter in his hand, he felt like electricity was going through his hands, and he knew that somehow my letter was special and that he was going to write back to me because he gets lots of letters in prison and that he would just throw half of them away, and, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, long story later, over um, – 2,500 letters later and over, um, I don't know, like 1,000 tapes, 1,000 hours of tapes um, that I recorded all our conversations later, that's how the book came about. But just to bring you up to speed on, um, you know, from seeing the confession mm-hmm. video to writing the first thank you letter and getting his his first letter, back in 2000, I went to Stateville Prison where he was incarcerated and visited him. Um, he wanted me to come and visit. And when he was um, visiting me in the visiting room, he got down on his knees, asked me to marry him if he ever got his freedom. And then as soon as I said yes, he got up and he sat down and he looked me straight in the eye and said, I trust only you to get this information out to the people because I know your heart's in the right place. I've had many people ask me to do movies, books, all these different things. I only trust you to do it, and will you help me write a book? And I said, uh, it's kind of like, what? Me? You know, a little old me. And so um, mm-hmm. I said, yeah, I mean, with God's help, I'll do it. But, I mean, I, I don't know what to write because, you know, I'm a regular person, and you were in the CIA and the Chicago mob. So I don't I don't know anything about it other than what I've studied and researched, you know, in the one initial book and then my other research that I started to research the New World Order and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, we started the journey then and um, had had a few setbacks with um, people trying to steal my material and publish other books. And, oh, it was a crazy time. But finally got the book out and... Um, what we have now is Interview with History, the JFK assassination. People can get it on our website or at the publisher's website if they are interested because the regular mainstream um, bookstores don't carry it. So, yeah, um, mm. I guess that's my nutshell version of how I met James Files. But, I mean, there's a lot more details to it and all the things that have happened over the years. But that's initially how wow. it happened when when I was just asking God to show me something about end times, about the truth, about what's going on. So my advice to anybody out there asking and praying to God to show them something or bring them something or do something, just be careful for what you ask for because you never know. I mean, if somebody would have told me back in 1997 that my life was going to go down this path and that I would be doing all this with James Wilde, I would have told them they're crazy because it's just, it's a wild ride that I've been on. And I just never anticipated my life life would take a turn like this. Uh, this is this is historical. Uh, we have with us world-renowned author, um, Pamela J. Ray, um, the author of the blockbuster book, Interview with History, the JFK Assassination, uh, here and only here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. And she's also uh, the uh, fiancé uh, of the grassy no shooter uh, of, in, within the JFK assassination. Uh, uh, Sister Pam, what, uh, at what point during your investigation uh, in those years of meeting uh, Mr. Ray, uh, taking notes, preparing to write this book, Interview with History, um, the JFK assassination, at what point did you actually believe or did you believe that this man, James E. Files, is not only authentic, but he is uh, truly was the grassy no shooter. What what um, was there a smoking gun or uh, or a light that went off in your spirit? At what point in time in your um, visitation to Mister Files and all of those years going uh, to prison to visiting him and all of your meticulous preparation in writing this book? At what point did you say, you know what? This man is telling the truth. Well, initially when I saw the confession of the assassin video and I wrote to tell him that I appreciated him telling the truth, uh, just from that interview and from all the things that he was saying that matched my other research that I had begun doing since I found that book in the church library, I just realized that what he was saying, there's no way that he would know all that information unless he was telling the truth. 
And that's why I initially wrote to him. It wasn't to start uh, anything. It was just to say thank you. Because in the video, um talks about the FBI picking him up and um, torturing him, leaving him almost for dead. while well, they did think he was dead. Um, trying to get this um, ledger that um, him and this other guy that worked for the Chicago outfit, um, Charles Nicoletti, um, he's, he, they were trying to make him confess where it was because inside it, the ledger it had a whole bunch of different contract murders and whatnot. Charles Nicoletti kept track of that. I don't know why, but he did. And he had it all written down, but the FBI was trying to get that, and he never talked. I mean, he, they put a cattle prod on him in all sorts of places, and he screamed till he lost consciousness. They threw him out of a moving vehicle with his hands tied up and <clears throat> his legs tied up, you know, stark mm-hmm. naked, and they just thought he was dead, and he knew for sure it was the FBI that had done that to him because he said if it was the outfit or the CIA, they would have put a bullet in his head and made sure he was dead. He's a walking miracle. I mean, it's just, it, it it's a miracle. And then at the end, when he's, he was asked if he believed in God. He, I could tell there was a hunger there. I mean, he was saying, yeah, I guess so, because I found myself praying to him on several occasions. He showed me, you know, like over in Southeast Asia when there's about to be an ambush or something was going on with the war that, you know, if God didn't tell him in advance what was going to happen and he could avoid it, he would have been dead like 10 times over. And I was mm-hmm. just convinced at the beginning that he was telling the truth i i just could tell from the research that i had been doing and the the way he explained uh his role in i, I don't know if you've ever seen or heard of that uh, videotape confession of an assassin but it was put out he did the interview in 1994 and it was put out in mm-hmm. 1996 and then it was in blockbuster in 1998 um when i found it um, like I said, in the special interest section down on the bottom shelf. And as we all know, Blockbuster doesn't exist. VHS tapes don't exist. I mean, <laughs> it was just the timing of how all that happened um, that connected us. And then just through um, our correspondence and the more I asked um, and the more he revealed, the more I knew he was on the up and up. Um, he, he had nothing to gain by telling the truth about this. As a matter of fact, um, some people say, oh, well, he was sitting in prison. He made it all up. Well, guess what? Mm -hmm. (laughs) The FBI is the one that um, threw him under the bus and put his name out there. And he actually suffered in prison longer because they came and warned him, if you talk about this JFK stuff, we're going to give you more time. We're going to take away your appeal. We're going to, you know, just make your life hell and give you more time in prison. And basically they did that after he did. He went ahead and gave that interview. Um, so I'm like, well, he's, well, he's not awful. really gaining anything out of any of this. He's getting right. in trouble and, you know, it's, it's yeah. just been a long and road. this is so interesting. This is so interesting. I have uh, heard recently, um, uh, Sister Pam, that uh, the bullet that was found uh, in, uh, on a hospital bench or a bed in Parkland Hospital had the actual teeth marks uh, of James E. Files. I don't know if you've heard of that rumor. Uh, is that yeah, true? Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about two different things. Um, the yeah. stretcher, um, the bullet that was found on the stretcher at Parkland Hospital is Exhibit 399, and that's the one I think Jack Ruby planted there, and it was in pristine condition, yeah. and it was not the magic bullet that you know made all those wounds on Kennedy and um, Governor Conley. The bullet casing that was found that had the teeth marks on it was in Dealey Plaza. Somebody with a metal detector had found it buried, and they dug it up, and it had the teeth marks on it. And that's the shell casing that James Files said in his interview. Um, basically, he left that as his calling card after he ejected it from the Remington XP100 fireball that he used to, used in the assassination. He bit down on it and put it on the ledge of the fence there behind the stockade fence there in Dealey Plaza and that's the shell casing that has the teeth mark on it not the one that was found on the stretcher in Parkland Hospital this is amazing I'm going to ask you a question another question here uh, Pam and if it sounds Mm -hmm. direct and vile please forgive me Uh, I've been getting the multiplicity of emails all day and from our listeners around the world they're excited but they most of them wanted me to ask you this question Uh, if James E. File 
is indeed mm-hmm. the grassy nose shooter. Uh, why mm-hmm. is he still breathing? And, and, that's, okay. and that's the question that people are asking. Go right ahead. And, yeah, we've heard that, and we'll, we will continue to hear that. Um, the reason that he hasn't been killed isn't for a lack of trying. Uh, there, the government, the case that he was in Stateville Prison for was um, due to two off-duty um, detectives out of jurisdiction, out of uniform, uh, running him and his friend off the road, not announcing, hey, where are the cops? You know, you're under arrest. They just started shooting at him. They had a five, um, not 500, um, a $50,000 um, contract out on him. If they would have killed James Files, they would have collected on it. I actually talked to one of those guys. Um, I, I'm not going to use their name, just, you know, out of respect for him. But, um, yeah. yeah, he said, I wish I would have known what I was up against. So Jimmy was in, <laughs> James Files was in prison for basically self-defense, but tell that to the judge when, you know, cops are involved and they started the shooting and one guy got hit by uh, James Wells' partner. Nobody died, and he spent um, the last 25 years in prison for that. It wasn't anything to do with JFK because people are, oh, he's in prison because of JFK. No, he's not. Um, They tried to kill him then. Uh, before he got uh, in that shootout that he went to prison for, there were several other attempts on his life. Um, this is a God story because only God could keep him in the yes. safe. Um, since he's been out of prison um, since 2016, there have been uh, one one time there was a shooting, a uh, couple times, um, well, one time uh, a car came up on the sidewalk and, and uh, hit him and it he broke his foot and he had to set it himself. Um, another time, a couple guys um, tried to snatch him and they had FBI credentials with them and Jimmy had to, anyway, hand him back, you know mm-hmm. what, um, because they were wow. um, trying to take him. So anyway, it's not a lack of them trying. Um, and he's been under surveillance wow. since he's been out and, I asked him if I should even come over here because I lived in Hawaii. I mean, come on, Maui versus Chicago. Yes. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> it takes a little bit of faith to move that far away in, in this right. situation. But um, he said that the <laughs> surveillance is still there, but they're not following him around and trying to snatch him like um, like they were um, just prior to me right. coming over here. And he probably doesn't like me talking about all this stuff, but um, yes. he's on parole right now, so we got to be careful about what we're talking about. But yes. um, anyway, yeah, he um, he has through the years just miraculously survived. I mean, there's all sorts of things that could only be attributed to God's protection and God's hand on his life because he's not done yet, and the story's not over. And um, I, I could go into more details about other times that they've tried to kill him, but he's he's still alive and kicking. Wow. Um, Did James E. Fowles know uh, Lee Harvey Oswald uh, on a personal basis? Yes, he knew him from the CIA. They both had the same CIA controller, David Atlee Phillips. Um, Before the thing that happened in Dallas um, occurred, uh, they had been um, assigned to do some gun running down into Clinton, Louisiana. Uh, the guns mm-hmm. were destined for Haiti. And um, before the assassination, the week prior, um, James Files spent time with Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, he showed up at his motel that he was staying at, and James Files said the only person that would have known to tell Lee Harvey Oswald to go there would be David Atlee Phillips the CIA controller or handler, mm. whatever you want to call him. And um, he was instructed to go show James Falls around the area so he would know basically dead-end streets, railroad crossing, just the area itself and Dealey Plaza and also um, test fire um, weapons, not at a shooting range, but just somewhere in the area that would be safe to take, you know, some weapons and go test fire. And Lee Harvey Oswald was with them during that time, too. Mm. Did um, James E. Files, uh, you said he knew Charles Nicoletti personally. Am I correct in saying that? Yes. 
um, Charles Nicoletti noticed him when he was um, in his early 20s. He had gotten back from the military. Um, he he used to uh, race cars, and he liked the way he was a good driver, and he knew about weapons, and he basically became um, his driver. And then he worked directly with Charles Nicoletti all through the 60s and the 70s until um, Charles Nicoletti was killed here in um, Chicago over in Melrose Park. Um, he hmm. he basically was taking his orders from Sam Jane Connor, who got orders from Tony Accardo. And there's a few more layers above him, but basically that's who ran the Chicago outfit. Wow, this is powerful. Uh, we have with us author uh, Pamela J. Ray. I'm telling you this, uh, I feel uh, shivers up my spine right now as we are interviewing um, this great author uh, of Interview with History, uh, the JFK assassination with uh, world-renowned author Pamela J. Ray from Chicago, Illinois, and she is engaged to James E. Files, the grassy no shooter. Uh, how much was Mr. Files paid for his part in the JFK assassination? I believe total there was $30,000 exchanged for what he did in Dallas. And he said he wow. would have done it anyway just because Charles Nicoletti asked him to do it and the money was just, you know, extra because he never asked them for money for any of the jobs they did. He would, He just knew at some point he would get paid and he wasn't worried about it. But he he did mention in his first interview that he was paid thirty thousand dollars, and that was back in nineteen sixty three. So that was quite a bit of money back then. Man, this is powerful. Um, according to British historian Dr. Uh, Francis Richard Connolly, uh, he had said uh, that on November the twenty first. Uh, 1963, mm -hmm. the day before the JFK assassination, that um, some of the powers that be uh, met um, in Texas. Now, how authentic is this? We don't know, but Dr. Francis Richard Connolly has close ties to both uh, MI5 uh, and MI6, that these, uh, some of the powers that be, um, Many people, like you're talking about uh, uh, Charles um, Michello, uh, the head of the mob in New Orleans, uh, was at this particular meeting. And, and mind you, to all of our Global Spiritual Revolution partners, what I'm about to say, this is secondhand information, but um, Dr. Francis Richard Connolly, a British historian, has close ties to both uh, MI5 and MI6. Um, and some of the men that you may mention were at this meeting on um, the day before or the night before the Kennedy assassination on uh, mm -hmm. November 21st, 1963. They met in the home of oil man Clint Murchison. And these right. are uh, some of the following people. J. Edgar Hoover, uh, his homosexual lover, Clyde Tolson, both of these men had millions of dollars tied up in oil uh, accounts around the world. Um, the Harriman brothers, uh, Chauncey Holt and Bernard Parker, both of these men, Chauncey Holt and Bernard Parker, uh, were hired by the CIA uh, to create fake IDs for both the FBI and the Secret Service agents for that day. Uh, Cliff Carter mm -hmm. uh, came in. Uh, Governor John Connolly was at this meeting, the same man that was in the same car with JFK. Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Joseph Yarborough. Uh, it, the list goes on. Joseph, Joseph uh, Savella, uh, the uh, head of the Dallas, uh, Texas mob. Uh, Earl Cobble, the mayor of Dallas, Texas, his brother, Charles Cobble, was uh, um, fired from the CIA along with um, uh, Dallas uh, because of the Bay Pigs fiasco. So some of these names that you may mention, uh, David Atlee Phillips was there. Like I said, uh, Charles um, Machello was there. Uh, Richard N. Nixon. Uh, Sam Giancondo's reps, uh, Jack Ruby or Rubenstein, Richard M. Nixon, and H.L. Hunt. Um, that's, that's a key because 
uh, not to get away from what we're talking about as far as with your book here tonight, uh, H.L. Hunt was the bag man uh, for the Nation of Islam. Uh, up until uh, 1972, H.L. Hunt gave um, the Nation of Islam $100,000 a year, and Malcolm X exposed this, and this is one of the main reasons why uh, Malcolm X was uh, assassinated. You may mention of, of another um, mobster that really hit a nerve with me. Tony Ocardo was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Charles Nicoletti, uh, Milwaukee Phil uh, Adoricio. Uh, oh my God, the list goes on. Uh, Peter uh, LaCarville, the um, the mobster from New Mexico was there who had drove some of the assassins from Chicago to New Mexico. And then two days before the assassination, drove some of these assassins 600 miles from New Mexico to Dallas, Texas, and paid each assassin $50,000. Uh, Clint Murchison mm-hmm. was there. So um, um, George Bush Senior uh, was mm-hmm. there. So um, what what is your take in all of these key players uh, that took part in the JFK assassination? Am I hot? Am I cold? Or and, and, uh, what well, say you, uh, Miss Miss Ray? Well, I'm aware of the meeting at Clint Murchison's because um, some of my other research, and then also the documentary that was made, the men who killed Kennedy, and I wasn't aware that many people were at that that meeting. I, you mentioned yes. names that I know who you're talking about, but I I've never heard anyone put them all together at that same meeting the night before at his home there in Dallas. Um, what I make mm-hmm. of it is that it it was obviously something that they all agreed on was going to come down and it's going to be handled by Hoover to cover it up and. Everybody had their part to play, and I don't know if Ed Lansdale was at that meeting, but he was like a CIA ground coordinator there in Dealey Plaza. Mm. He showed up behind the stockade fence prior to the motorcade arriving and asked James Files if every if everything was in order, if everybody's ready and in place, and he said yes, and basically he was on on site as a grounds coordinator for the CIA because it basically was a coup d'etat. I mean, it, our government was wow. replaced, you know, by Kennedy was killed and Johnson was their war machine man. And that, that they wanted to realize the Vietnam War. They didn't want Kennedy pulling out troops, advisors and whatnot over there in Southeast Asia. They wanted that war. Um, there's a bunch of contractors wow. there and, and, um, Dallas and Fort Worth, you know, Bell Helicopter, just on and on, not to mention the guns, the bombs, you know, the arms and ammunition, the uniforms, the food. And I guess LBJ was part of what they call the khaki um, mafia, and he was about Mm -hmm. um, to make a whole bunch of money from not only the bombs and the guns and the helicopters and all that, but from, um, from just the logistics of providing everything you would need for war. Um, they wanted that war, <laughs> whether it was right or wrong. You know, we, we can look back now, and hindsight's twenty twenty, and you can see that the Cold War was a farce, and, you know, they played everybody's fears to the max to get them to agree that, yeah, communism's mm-hmm. bad, and we got to go over there and, you know, fight it, fight it, fight it. Um, so. Right. I, I see that get together as a realization of like business interests and war interests and you know mostly the business and making money interests. Kennedy wasn't going to play their games. He wanted to smash the CIA to a thousand pieces and basically mm-hmm. um, turn turn it all over to the Joint Chiefs of Staff that he would have control over because he basically felt after the Day of Pig he was out of, you know, he had no control over the CIA and basically he didn't. Um, This is something James Hmm. Files and I don't agree on. He staunchly defends the CIA um, and I staunchly see it for what it is and I don't think it's a good Hmm. agency especially since it was infiltrated by the Nazis left over from World War II. Um, mm-hmm. this is one of the things that we agree to disagree on because, like I said, we're going through our marriage classes and, <laughs> you know, we, we yes. don't bring up that. But he he's a Cold War warrior. He's a soldier to the end. Um, so we just don't go there. 
But um, yeah, it, they they mm-hmm. needed the war. They needed to realize that war. And as far as that meeting is concerned, I I I'm not aware that Tony Accardo was there, but I know Sam Giancana yeah. was in Dallas. Well, not me, no, for sure. It's you know secondhand information, but uh, he was staying right. at the um, Adolphus Hotel, and then the other guys were over at the Cabana Hotel, and so hmm. a bunch of people were in and hey, out of Dallas that yeah that that, that wow. week and weekend. And- you know, it's interesting, and I'm so glad we're we're talking about this. And uh, excuse me, <laughs> and I'm so excited to have Miss um, Pamela J. Ray, uh, who is a powerful author, um, praise God, of this blockbuster book. And she's going to give you information uh, near the end of the broadcast how you can purchase her um, blockbuster book, Interview with History, um, the JFK Assassination, uh, with author Pamela J. Ray, um, also in conjunction with James E. Files, the grassy no shooter. So James E. Files, just to give clarification, he is the actual badge man on the grassy knoll who took the kill shot to kill President um, John F. Kennedy. He took the shot, and he was behind the picket fence, but he wasn't wearing a police uniform, and he isn't the badge man. That must have been somebody else back there that had a uniform on, but he said he didn't see any police, and he scanned the area, obviously, to make sure, you know, there weren't police next to him when he's doing something like that. And, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, he he was Mm -hmm. wearing a reversible jacket, and Mm -hmm. when he was just checking the area out, it had, like, a plaid on the inside, and then after the shot was fired, he reversed his jacket, and it was like a sil- or gray, silver color, um, a material called poplin. I, I've never heard of it, but he said, yeah, it was a mm-hmm. popular thing back in the 60s. And he put his fedora hat on and put the gun back in the briefcase and basically walked away from Dealey Plaza like he was a businessman going to a lunch or something. He was told not to run or, mm. you know, act suspicious. And here's an interesting thing that we actually didn't put in our book, but um, we're we're working on another book because there's a lot of information that didn't get put in interviews history, and this book is mm-hmm. basically published almost 10 years ago, so um, we're we're updating it. And um, he he saw hmm. George H. W. Bush there in Dealey Plaza as he was exiting the plaza o- over by the Texas School Book Depository building. I'm like, are you sure it was him? Oh, of course I know it was him. So I go, well, what was he doing? He was just, he had one foot up against the um, wall, like he was leaning against his foot, and he was just watching everybody, and he didn't, I didn't say anything to him, he didn't say anything to me, but I know it was him, because he basically recruited him into Mm. this thing called Operation Group 40, and he, he was there in Dallas that day, and a lot of times people say, here's a picture of George Bush by the book depository that you know he's a, he's denied saying it was him it's the, you know and then another memo said his name on it and no no that was a different george mm-hmm. bush but it was the george bush that just buried his wife barbara um george bush senior and he was he was there in dallas that wow day. so yeah. just to clarify excuse me uh to all of our um listeners all over the world you're saying uh, former president george h w bush was in Dealey Plaza that day during the uh, the very day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Am I correct in saying that? Yes. Wow. And was James Files saw him. Wow. What, um, there's, yeah. been, there's been some photos of, of supposedly of uh, George H. W. Bush as well. Go right ahead. There, there's been uh, photos of him where? Yeah, they're saying that there are are photos of George H. W. Bush in Daly Plaza, uh, you know, during that day. I think Jim Morris had put out some photos years ago. Uh, Yeah, um, go ahead, go right ahead. This is interesting. I showed the pictures to James Files, and I said, "Is this does this look like George Bush being in the plaza?" And he said, "Yeah, that's where he was. He was over there by the book depository building." Now, George H.W. Bush had testified um, back in the 70s um, of the JFK Assassination Oversight Committee that he was not the director of the CIA, 
or the deputy director of the CIA during the uh, the JFK assassination. But there's a lot of JFK um, scholars that are saying that he's lying, that G- uh, George H. W. Bush was either the director of the CIA or the deputy director during that time. Go redheads. Uh, no, sorry. no, he wasn't. He wasn't the director or the deputy director of the CIA back in the early 60s. It didn't come later until later. Mm. Um, he no. was, was he a involved? recruiter. He was a recruiter yeah. for the anti-Castro Cuban um, groups and what's known as Operation Group 40. Mm. He, he, he was, wow. He was with the CIA, but he wasn't the director until, what was it, when Gerald Ford was president? I'm trying to remember yeah, exactly think in, when he... Yeah, we're talking about 74, 75, maybe 74? Yeah, he, he, he was the director then. Mm-hmm. And they even named oh, the, I the Langley Center after him, the George H.W. Bush Center for Intelligence or something like that. Yeah, they they named it after him. But he he was involved with the CIA, but not the director until like the, the 70s. Was George H. W. Bush or uh, Bush again? Was George H. W. Bush involved in the planning of the assassination of John F. Kennedy? Uh, he might have been, but if I asked James Files that question directly, he would say no. The only people that were directing me to go be part of what was going on in Dallas would have been Charles Nicoletti and David Atlee Phillips. And. Oh, this is this is scary. This is powerful. Uh, we have uh, with us a uh, world-renowned uh, author, uh, scholar when it comes to um, the JFK assassination, and, and truly, I am really honored. And so is our uh, all of our listeners all over the world uh, to have um, this powerful author, and whom I believe God has raised up and anointed. Uh, for such a time as this, and that is uh, world-renowned author Pamela J. Ray. She is recognized as an expert on the CIA and mob uh, assassin of James E. Files, uh, the grassy knoll shooter uh, here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. If we can backtrack a little, going back to um, Mr. Files, his, his early days within the agency, how did mm-hmm. he, how was he recruited by the agency, number one, and two, um, how did he meet the mob and some um, the, the Chicago outfit, as you uh, named them earlier? What was, what is this association with uh, Sam Giacano? How did they meet? Do, do you want the CIA first and then the mob? Yes, yeah, uh, let's see the CIA first I, and then we go to the mob. There's a little uh. story on each one. Um, yes. He was he went into the uh, army when he was 17 years old. And he was 82nd Airborne, and he went through all his training, and then he was shipped to Laos in 1959. Um, Some things happened over there where he uh, ended up um, killing a few people that were um, supposedly on our side uh, to save face with the Laotian people there. And he wrote his own court-martial and basically got sent to a hospital here in Illinois, for uh, evaluation, and when he was done with that time in the the hospital, um, he was recruited into the CIA on recommendation from uh, Ted Shackley to um, David Phillips. Uh, David Phillips recruited him um, into the CIA at that time, and then basically his military service came to an end, even though he would go do military things, more like paramilitary things later. Um, That's how he got into being uh, a CIA person. And then um, as far as the mob goes, um, he grew up in Melrose Park and the Italians were his neighbors. And I guess Jackie Cerrone would come around and give him five bucks to shine his, you know, hubcaps and rub his car down Mm -hmm. or something, you know, and back then five bucks was a lot of money. (laughs) And so he grew up with the Italians, and when he came back from his military time, and then uh, he didn't walk around the neighborhood saying, oh, guess what, I'm in the CIA now. He didn't tell anybody. His family didn't know. Nobody knew until much later on. Even half of them now even have a hard time believing it. 
but um, Charles Nicoletti um, wanted him to be his driver, and then from there he was connected through Charles Nicoletti to Sam and Tony and, you know, all the main players in the Chicago outfit. Wow. So Jan yeah. Connell, excuse me, uh, oh, my, uh, Tony Arcardo, they knew James E. Files. Am I correct in saying that? Oh, yeah. He he stood guard over there at Tony Accardo's house. Uh, you know, wow. like if he wanted somebody watching the perimeter of his home, he would have um, James Files do that. Sam um, called him the barefoot hillbilly. Um, one of his <laughs> favorite stories to say is he'd, he'd be in his home or whatever cooking some fish, and he goes, Jimmy, come over here and look at this. Point at the frying pan with the fish, and he goes, do that fish? He would have kept his mouth shut. He'd still be alive today. And, you know, he just he, mm. he, he said he would um, give him things to do, him and Charles Nicoletti, um, things that I probably shouldn't talk too much detail about. Plus, I, I don't know a lot of details on some things that I shouldn't even talk about because he's kept me from some things that there's no statute of limitations on, so I'm not going to say anything that could get him or me in trouble. Um, mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, those guys... Um, Charles Nicoletti was basically their main, one of their main hitmen, and if something needed to happen in that department, then he would, Sam would send Charles Nicoletti and or James Files together to go do stuff. And his name basically was Sutton until 1963, and then it got changed to James Files. The CIA. Mm, why did he change his name? name changed. Oh, oh, did, oh okay. be- I see. Be- Mm-hmm. Because he was working with the um, Anna Castro Cubans, and he wanted to get married back then, um, and he wanted his name to be different so that they couldn't find him as easy. Look him up and find him under his last name Sutton. Man, this is powerful. Uh, we have with this world right now author Pamela J. Ray, uh, interview with history, the JFK assassination, uh, and also not only is she a powerful author, she's um, a child of God, she's a Christian, and that is the, excuse me, the most important thing, and she's also um, engaged to James E. Files, 929-477-3997. Again, and back again, uh, to Dr. Francis Richard Connolly, he has close ties to not only to MI5 and MI6 there in London, but he um, is very connected, interconnected with the British deep state. He had made mention of all these names, including uh, Tony Ocardo, being at the um, at this uh, meeting. Uh, mm-hmm. There in in Texas the night before uh, before the JFK assassination and in, in, in the home of Oriole Man Clint uh, Clint Murchison he also said Dr. Colony said that uh, you when you talked about the groundwork that really uh, hit a nerve with me uh, Pam that uh, mm-hmm. according to Dr. Connolly uh, some of the groundwork uh, that was laid uh, with a man by the name of Dr- Jack. Uh, Crichton, uh, George mm-hmm. W. Bush um, laid the groundwork, including including working with a man by the name of George Lumpkin, uh, Lieutenant General George uh, Whitmire, uh, including uh, Harry Weatherford, um, and they controlled not just um, the groundwork, but they also helped the CIA to control uh, what to do with the body of JFK. There's a lot of rumors. Uh, going on within the, the intelligence community it have been for decades um, mm-hmm. that um, the body of JFK uh, was not even in the coffin uh, when it was um, shipped back, aired back to Washington, D.C., and that the actual body and brain of JFK is not even buried in Arlington Cemetery. Um, uh, what tell you about that? Um, yeah, James Files told me um, back when we were working on our books that um, Ted Shackley had mentioned to him that the Kennedy family had requested that the body not be put in Arlington, that could never be dug up um, for a variety of reasons, but it was um, put in a um, like a concrete um, burial vault. Holes were drilled into it that were the size of like a softball, and um, it was... Hmm pushed out of a um, like an army helicopter, plane, something of that, that sort, um, and it's out in the Atlantic Ocean. 
his body is not under that really? eternal flame in Arlington, yeah. I'll repeat that again, what you just said, uh, and take your time, because this this is the very first time that I'm hearing of this. This is so powerful. Go right ahead. Repeat what you just said, uh, um, Pamela. Um, JFK's body is not in Arlington Cemetery. Um, the flame there is a nice memorial for JFK, but his actual body is out in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, he found out about that through a fellow CIA person um, named Ted Shackley, and he said it was the Kennedy family that had requested that um, that it be put out in the Atlantic Ocean because they didn't want um, anybody digging it up later. Um, Bobby Kennedy pretty much had to swallow the pill that Lee Harvey Oswald did all the shooting from behind, but they knew there was more going on. And any kind of... Um, <sighs> exhuming the body would reveal that and actually i don't know if you know about joe west or not joe west is the one no. that um came and talked to james files in stateville and he actually didn't even know he's the shooter but he was in the process he was a private investigator down there in um, houston texas but he was getting um, the court um, to ex exhume the body of jfk because um, he thought that if he could hmm. get the body exhumed and have um, the head examined. It would. Um, he was telling them that there was tra there would be traces of mercury, like James Files. Um, the round that he fired had a mercury um, load on it, uh, and it mm -hmm. makes the bullet fragment. And um, anyway, Joe West was um, wow. getting the court case to get JFK's body exhumed. This is like in the early 90s, and mm. he he um, was in the process of getting that done. And he went into the hospital for a routine thing to happen with his um, heart surgery, and he was mm -hmm. uh, recovering okay, but then he died suddenly, um, and so did his mm. court case. And so nobody ever mm -hmm. um, examined JFK's body. But, yeah, I mean, the only way to prove this is to, you know, dig it up and say, okay, there's nothing there. Some people think uh, J.D. Tippett's buried there, but I think there's just an empty right. grave there that, yeah, so. And, and anyway. I'm glad that you brought up J.D. Tippett because that was a rumor, too. <laughs> Excuse me, that um, J.D. Tippett, uh, according to uh, some reports of some of the retired uh, uh, Dallas um, PD officers who are now retired, said that uh, J.D. Tippett not only looked like JFK, but they nicknamed, nicknamed him JFK uh, II, and that the body. Um, that came in that coffin off of Air Force One was the body of J.D. Tippett. I don't know if you've heard anything uh, concerning that. Um, I've heard rumors of that, but I, I've not spent a lot of time um, pursuing that. Um, I, I just wanted to answer your question directly about um, yes. JFK's body in Arlington, but um, I, mm -hmm. I have heard those rumors that um, they did a switch and uh, the whole um, – the whole thing that happened at Bethesda Naval Hospital for the autopsy and then the reconstruction of his head basically put the back part of his wow. something on the back of his head so that when they did take pictures or drew pictures, they didn't actually allow the uh -huh. um, photographs. Um, it it just totally covered up what basically had happened, which went entered the temple and then it blew the whole back uh -huh. part of the the head out and mm. they they couldn't have that because that shows you know an exit wound and if lee harvey oswald's shooting from the sixth floor in the book depository building and that's from behind you know they that doesn't add up so back in the no. 60s i guess people just weren't mm. you know putting all this together some people were like jim mars and um that guy yeah. called um ken jones and um mm -hmm. just there have been a few people that have been doing it for a long, long time, but the majority of the public just wanted to put it behind them and basically uh, accepted the Warren Commission, even though they knew it probably wasn't the full and complete story. And even to this day, most people, if you ask 10 people just randomly who killed Kennedy, they'll say Lee Harvey Oswald, and that's just right. another thing James Files always says. He goes, once the government tells a lie, they have to live the lie. And 100 years from now, the history books are going to say, you know, Lee Harvey Oswald was the one that did it, and there was no conspiracy, and that's the end of the story. Yeah, and I'm going to say this one more time concerning 
um, this MI5, MI6 uh, um, person who's, who's connected with the British intelligence agency there uh, in, in the British intelligence community, uh, Dr. Uh, Richard uh, Francis Richard Connolly, he said again uh, concerning that the groundwork, um, mm-hmm. and he, and he's, uh was powerfully articulating that the uh, 488th uh, military detachment uh, group, uh, privately funded uh, by the CIA, was put in charge of taking care of the groundwork in this. 488th military detachment uh, had people, assassins, within this um, group of mercenaries who belonged to um, the John Birch Society, who belonged to the Mm -hmm. KKK, uh, who Mm -hmm. um, half of the uh, Dallas Police Department also belonged to this 488th military detachment. Um, And I believe that uh, before her passing, Again, this is according to British intelligence. Um, it was the LBJ's uh, mistress, um, Madeline Duncan Brown, was mm-hmm. also at the house of this uh, oil man, Kent Murchison, and was waiting mm-hmm. for her, um, her, uh, her boyfriend, LBJ, who she had a child by. Uh, and right. LBJ ran late, and LBJ had said that um, by tomorrow, the 22nd of November, uh, these, uh, excuse the expression, these bastards will not make fun of me or anymore or will not make me, a, will not make a fool of me anymore. And she says, is that a threat? He said, yes, I guarantee it. So this is scary. This is, uh, when you may mention of the ground force, and that's uh, one of the things that British intelligence is saying. But um, getting back to your book, and again, you blew my mind, um, Pam, when you just said uh, a few minutes ago that JFK's body uh, is buried out, excuse me, out at sea. I had never heard of that before. That's scary. That is scary. Yeah. So the body is out at sea. It cannot be found. Am I, am I correct, you think? That's, that's correct. Oh, my God. And, and there's a lot of these uh, uh, political scientists and, and, and scholars when it co- uh, comes to the JFK assassination. Another reason why, this is just another a synopsis, but uh, one of the main reasons why um, the CIA did not want um, the body of JFK to be buried in all his cemetery, like you said, for fear that his body would be exhumed right. and, and that, if it was uh, ever, that his brain um, would be... Uh, handled with, properly, they, it, it, they could tell that those mercury um, bullet, well, the mercury round that James Files fired for the headshot, um, mercury never goes away. And so if his head was there, you know, uh-huh. it, it would have shown the path of the bullet. Um, that's why the brain went missing because it showed um, metallic hmm. fragments. And I have a 1964 um, Warren Commission report and it talks about in the medical evidence that um, they call it rotogen or something like that with a fancy name for x-rays. Um, they even talk about in the old original um, Warren Commission report that those those fragments were in um, President Kennedy's brain and they were making medical reports about it. And then mm-hmm. I've got a 1993 edition of the Warren Commission report, and then that part of it's conveniently left out. But the original one mm-hmm. is still there. And that's oh, really? And, wow. Yeah. James Files um, talked about the Mercury round a long time, you know, like that's the the round that he used um, and the weapon that he used. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, the, and that People are like, well, where's the evidence? Well, there it is, right there, right. even in the Warren Commission report. They <laughs> left it there by mistake. Hmm. And uh, what happened to um, the rifle that uh, Mr. Files used, this Remington Model XB100? Um, what happened to that rifle? Um, the rifle was kept by James Files until he went to federal prison. Um, and I asked him this just a couple of days ago. Well, what? How many rounds did you take down to Dallas with you? And he said there was five rounds with the mercury load. I go, well, did you test fire any of them? He goes, no. And I go, so you just used the one, and so there was four rounds left. And he said, yeah. 
And I go, well, what happened to the fireball and to the extra round? And he said, basically, I kept it in the same briefcase where the fireball was kept. And when I went to federal prison um, over at my aunt's house underneath the bed where it was, one of the relatives found that, got into it, um, started plinking birds over there in Round Lake Beach, Illinois, and Basically, the cops were called. They came and took the weapon, and it hasn't been seen since. Oh, boy. Wow. Can you imagine if that gun was in um, in your possession? Oh, man, that's history. Um, we have Pamela J. Ray with us tonight. Um, you are opening up my eyes, um, uh, Miss Ray, here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio, the author of Interview with History, the JFK Assassination. Uh, also, uh, she is the fiancé of James E. Files, the grassy no shooter. Um, did Mr. Files ever tell you how many assassins were involved or were each assassin kind of um, autonom- autonomous from each other? compartmentalized as far as he knows and he's been asked it many times how many shooter teams were there as far as he knows the only people that he knows for sure that were shooting in Dealey Plaza were Charles Nicoletti and himself not to say other people weren't there doing shooting but for sure that he can confirm that he knows for sure uh, Charles Nicoletti was in the Daltech building probably around the third second or third floor he's not sure exactly where uh, Eugene Hale Brading is the one that let them in he's associate of H.L. Hunt, Mm -hmm. let him into the Daltech building. Him and Johnny Roselli were in there. Um, Johnny Roselli was supposed to be a shooter. Um, He came in early that morning on a flight, pilot still alive, Um, Tosh Plumley. He brought him in. They were supposed to be an abort team. Um, He he came and told uh, Charles Nicoletti about that, and he's like, swear word, you know, we're going to do this. If Sam wants this called off, he's here. If if he tells us we're not doing it, you know, then we'll not do it. But we're not going to take, you know, anybody's word for it but Sam. And so Sam never got word to them that it was off, so it was on. Plus, Lansdale came behind the fence and said, you know, or, is everybody in place? So as far as James Files knows, because he cleaned um, Charles Nicoletti's weapon later, um, he he knows that he fired it because he, he, he knows what a weapon looks like when you have to clean it. And he knows mm-hmm. that he fired that shot from behind the um, fence. But I, I told him there's a lot more shooting going on. He goes, well, if they had um, assassins there and sharpshooters there, they were some of the worst in the world because they couldn't even hit the um, car, let alone the president. So he he doesn't have <laughs> a very high opinion of the other people that were there shooting. And even Charles Nicoletti um, shooting, he's more used to, for mob hits, you know, uh, a mm-hmm. close up like a handgun or a shotgun kind of thing versus a rifle and um, before they had gone down to Dallas I asked them if they had ever gone out and done any you know shooting at a firing range to practice and he said yes and I go well did mm-hmm. you ever practice on a moving target and he goes no not with Charles Nicoletti but I told him you're going to have to you know account for this you know, when they're moving away, mm-hmm. you're going to have to shoot up high. You know, just what you have to tell somebody if they're going to be shooting at a moving target. And he was counting all these um, rounds that were being shot as a miss, 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 because he said they were going for a headshot. And by the time JFK was coming into the view of where he was supposed to be a backup shooter behind the fence there, um, if, if he would have waited any longer, even like one second longer, it, it might have um, hit Jackie and they were told nothing, you know, not to ha- have anything happen to her. And so he had to take the shot when he did. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been what it did. I'm not saying it's a good thing. It's just what happened. And um, wow. so as far as he knows, it was him and Charles Nicoletti. But in all my research, I got a feeling there was a few other people shooting at the president. Um, he thinks the throat wound was an hmm. um, exit wound. I think it's an entrance wound from somebody else shooting from the front, not necessarily behind the fence, but somewhere else. Um, that's what initially made him grab his throat. Uh, and there's a nick in his tie. You know, the physical evidence shows that there was some kind of wound in the neck. And then they opened it up and made it um, tracheotomy so he could breathe better. But then there's um, other shots in his back. Um, there's Connolly's shot. And, of course, we don't believe in the magic bullet, you know, Arlen Specter and 
you know, the magic bullet. Right. So I think I think there <laughs> right. were other shooters. Uh, I don't want to speculate, and James Files never speculates. He says, I can't say who was there. I just know I shot and Charles Nicoletti shot because I cleaned his gun later. So. This is interesting. Wow. I, I heard uh, recently, um, Miss Ray, concerning um, one of the other assassins, possible assassins, um, a man by the name of uh, Charles Boyd Harrison, um, mm-hmm. who was a, a hitman for the mob. Now, um, Mr. Harrison was the uh, the father of Hollywood uh, actor Woody Harrison. I don't know if you've heard mm-hmm. of that rumor um, that uh, Charles Boyd Harrison was indeed one of the assassins. I've heard that rumor, but I, I just haven't really pursued it or studied it much because um, it's supposedly he's one of the tramps, too, and I, I just I really right. don't get into it. If Mac Wallace was the one that was up on the sixth floor shooting or who was up on the records building up on the roof shooting or who came out of the sewer uh, storm drain shooting, I I just I haven't spent a lot of time pursuing all that because um, I just haven't <laughs> because I know other people yeah. are shooting. And it's just there's so many um, trails to go down that it's That's something deep. you realize <laughs> when you start studying all this information, there's, so much disinformation that's put out there. It, it kind of gets crazy, and you have to decide what you're going to focus on. So Exactly. Uh, I, I saw today, excuse me, I'm so sorry, on, um, on a report online that the um, warden, Tony uh, Godinez, um, uh, who was at the prison where, and you can confirm this with James Files, I don't know if this is true or not, but the, the warden of the prison there in Illinois, Tony Godinez, mm-hmm. uh, had mm-hmm. said that he believed that James Fowle was the grassy known shooter and that James mm-hmm. Fowle uh, was a very credible witness and that he was mm-hmm. indeed uh, contracted by uh, the Central Intelligence Agency, including uh, the mob there in Chicago, to take out uh, John F. K. I mean, yeah, uh, right. uh, J. F. K. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. That that's um, that's a good person to verify. Uh, he had access to all his records, so he, he wow. knew about his past and. Back here's a little a side story. Um, back in the um, early days when he first got the state bill, I guess I go, well, was it Jim Garrison or was it somebody from his office? Because I think Jim Garrison died in '92. He said yeah. I thought it was Jim Garrison, but it might have been um, somebody from his office. But they had called the prison up there and they talked to the warden Godinez, and they wanted to come up and talk to um, James Files and. Basically, right. um, he the, sent the guards down to go get him and <clears throat> bring him up to the office, and then they called back, and um, basically hmm. he wanted to find out about um, his involvement with um, one of the witnesses there down in New Orleans right. and also um, the JFK assassination itself. And basically um, he just told him, save your jet fuel, don't come up here because I don't have anything to say to you. So, and the wow. warden stood by him for all that. Yeah. They were, they, and I wanted to know how they hmm. got his name. Jim Garrison right. was on the trail of the assassins. Jim Garrison um, hmm. was doing an excellent job. And I go, well, why, why if he was on the wrong trail, why, why were people dying and why did they have to shut him down? He goes, because they, he wasn't on the wrong trail. He was on the trail. And mm-hmm. so if Jim Garrison would have been able to be successful back in the late 60s and actually get some convictions wow. on even Clay Shaw and all the people that were surrounded um, Oswald down there in New Orleans, it would have unraveled the whole thread and it, we would have had the truth a long time ago. But we saw what happened to Jim Garrison, right? Wow. I, I, I was going to ask you that, uh, Pamela. Did um, uh, Jim Garrison ever uh, interview James Files? That was my next question. And wow. Uh, no. This is powerful. He, uh, Mm-hmm. He didn't. But wow. I'm thinking that somebody had his name, though, because the FBI has known about James Files' role in um, JFK since 
1964, and it was the FBI in the uh, late 80s, early 90s that gave investigator Joe West that I was telling you about that was trying to get JFK's body exhumed. It was the FBI that gave him the lead on a prisoner in Joliet Prison. Um, so mm. the FBI has known about James Files for a long time. But officially, the official report from the FBI is that, oh, James Files is non credible. He's, he's just a liar and trying to get attention mm. for himself. But yeah. yeah, well, that's what, the, that's the what they try to do to Jim admit. Garrison. Right. Yeah. Wow. Man, this is so fascinating, you know. And uh, I'm telling you, if ever a Mr. Files, uh, your fiancé, wants to speak to the media or to um, a radio host, please let us be the first ones. Um, because we are Christian, we are a nationally syndicated uh, Christian conservative uh, counterculture broadcast, and it would be oh such a tremendous blessing to um, interview uh, history, uh, Mr. James E. Yeah. Files, how history was transformed forever on that day of November 22nd, 1963-929-477-3997. Uh, can you uh, spend uh, just a few more minutes with us? We don't want to uh, tire you out, but we would love for you to come back uh, to do our part two. Um, it would be a great honor for us to have you, Ms. Ray. Okay, well, um, just let me know when. And if anybody wants the book, I, I would like to tell them how to get the book, too. It's, yes. It's, uh, how can they, how can they uh, purchase this book? Um, you can get it through our website or the publisher's website. Author House published it. So if you just go to Author House, put in the title or my name, Pamela J. Ray, and the book will come up, Interview with History. Or if you want a signed copy, um, there's, you can get one uh, domestically or internationally. There's a there's a button there on the main page that you can go to, and that's on JFK Murder James Files dot Weebly dot com. Mm. That's JFK Murder James Files dot Weebly dot com, and those are for the signed copy. But even if you go to our website and you don't want to pay for the signed copy, then you can just hit the link that'll take you to the um, publisher, and then. You can get the book through uh, the publisher's website. And then also, um, if anybody's interested, we have some artwork and some um, photos and autographs. If if anybody wants that, uh, we have some on eBay if anybody wants to help support our our publishing efforts because we're we're trying to get another book out there. um, Absolutely. We're we're, we're limited, so he's he's selling his artwork. (laughs) And I'm telling you, and and if uh, need so, um, I would definitely travel to Chicago to interview the both of you. Uh, I'm telling you, this is historic. Um, um, according to uh, Wikipedia, you know, Wikipedia, that's that's really not a um, authentic um, um, information slot or information foundation to believe in, but uh, it says that. Um, and here's a quote: Not only is Not only is what I did classified, I'm classified. And according to Wikipedia, James Fowle said this. Did he say that? Yes, he did. And yes, he is classified. And there's um, a whole whole other show talking about that, too. um, That I I don't know how much of it I can even talk about because it is classified, but some of it. Some of it's going to be in our upcoming work that we're working on. Um, yeah. So there's some things he cannot yeah. talk about today, right, because he's still classified. Yeah. Yeah. There's some of his secrets that he's taken to his grave, and that's just the way that's going to be. And I'm I'm comfortable with it because I don't need to know every deep, dark, gory secret. Um, wow. But to help people understand, there are some things that we can talk about. And like I said, we're going to be putting him in our upcoming book and some of the other um, – projects that we're working on. I noticed in the contents of in our remaining minutes here of your book uh concerning Marilyn Monroe Marilyn Monroe and the Kennedy mm-hmm. brothers. Um uh, what is yep. your take on that part of history? Uh Marilyn was pregnant with JFK's baby and she wouldn't get an abortion and uh she was offered money and she wouldn't take uh-huh. it and she said blank blank the F the Kennedy's and um, I'm having my baby and 
basically she was under the impression that he was going to divorce Jackie and marry her and they were going to all live in the White House and she she was like losing it thinking that um, she was going to have his baby and everything was going to work out good for her and her friend Jeannie Carmen was trying to tell her hey Marilyn <laughs> no you can't do that you, 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 you got to get the abortion you can't have his baby you got to shut your mouth and I guess she was going to have a um, press conference the following Monday oh, and boy. Yeah, Bobby Kennedy was dispatched to make sure she didn't do that. So uh, just to clarify, um, because I don't like to misquote people, uh, Marilyn Monroe was pregnant with JFK's baby, and she was told to get an abortion. She she said no. Um, Bobby Kennedy, Senator Robert F. Kennedy, was dispatched by the White House to help take out Marilyn Monroe. Am I correct in saying that? Uh, yeah, he was there to tell her that she it was over and she had to get the abortion. And basically, um, Sam Giancana sent the assassins that actually gave her her final enema. Um, they came from Chicago and flew in wow. and then did it and then flew out. And the pilot that did that flying is still alive. Yeah. Wow. So... Uh, just to reiterate, man, this is powerful, uh, Miss Ray. So uh, Sam Giancana sent out some assassins to take out, excuse me, to take out um, Marilyn Monroe. And uh, are you allowed to give out some of those names of the assassins, or um, um, is that yeah, classified? But we're actually writing a book about it too. Um, it's called Murdering Marilyn. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Charles Nicoletti was one of the guys that went and made sure she didn't have the press conference. Mm -hmm. Wow. So how many assassins took her out uh, besides Mr. Nicoletti? Uh, There was one other person that was with Mr. Nicoletti. Wow. And that person is still alive today? No. Oh, they're not. Okay. He's He's long gone, too. Okay, so uh, just be clear and specific. Two assassins that Sam Giacano sent to uh, to Los Angeles to silence Marilyn Monroe, and both of them are dead. Wow, this is scary. I never yeah. knew that. Here, here, <laughs> wow. Yeah, here's how it would happen. Um, Bobby Kennedy calls a lawyer. A lawyer calls Sam. Sam tells him to take care of it. He dispatches um, the assassins. The assassins get on a plane. Um Somebody like James Files drives them to the airport. Um, right. They they get on a plane. They go to Los Angeles. They take care of Marilyn. They fly back. He picks them up, and that's that, and they don't talk about it because when something happens, they don't talk about it. Wow. Did uh, Mr. Files drive them to the airport, or you just use his yes. name as, a, as an example? He did yes, drive he them. Did. Okay. Wow. So he drove them to O'Hare to fly to Los Angeles. Um, no, it's a smaller, um, it's called the Executive Airport here in um, Chicago, and that's the name of it now, but wow. it used to be the Pal- Palawaki or something like that, um, the airport wow. that's north of O'Hare, or west of O'Hare, I, I don't know, I'm learning this area, but it's it's another small airport, but it's not Midway. Wow, and uh, is that still in existence, that specific airport? Uh, it is, but it's a different name. I think it's called the Executive um, Airport. Executive. Okay. Yeah. And so um, this I never, so James E. Files drove Charles Nicoletti and a second assassin to the small airport in Chicago, outside of Chicago, to fly to Los Angeles yes. to take out Marilyn Monroe. And are you allowed to give us the other name of the assassin? I'm not sure if I should or not. I should probably just wait mm-hmm. and see if that's okay. <clears throat> I promise people. you, we we. I, <laughs> oh wow! If you can't, that would be awesome. Well, we want pressure. Wow, 
Um, well, man, having Bobby I'm Kennedy tell- involved is bad enough, right? I'm sure Ethel Kennedy doesn't exactly. hear about that. <laughs> wow. This is so interesting. Uh, two minutes, and we're going to let you go, Pamela. And I'm so sorry for keeping you so long uh, because I know you have uh, a lot on your plate. You're so busy. And uh, maybe one day uh, we have to get you here to New York for a book signing and for a lecture. Uh nine two nine four seven seven three nine nine seven. We got so many questions coming in and we won't be able to get to them tonight. Maybe the next time that Miss Ray comes on the air, uh we can get to some of your questions. Uh, and continue to send in your questions right now at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio at Yahoo.com. Again, beloved Global Spiritual Revolution Radio at Yahoo.com. And maybe next time uh, we will get into uh, the missing link of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, uh, once an assassin, now a Christian. So you guys are a part of a local church there in Chicago, and and um, yes. and so – yeah, and so how how is your uh, church receiving Mr. Files and 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 uh, um and yeah yeah <laughs> um it's it's been interesting um yeah. they they just kind of get really wide eyed when he starts talking about his past and um, wow. yeah uh, we're going through the pre marriage classes because we want to do do it right and bring God into yes. the situation. And um, Absolutely. I'm, I'm not sure if you read in, in our book yet about um, the Lord Jesus coming to James Files when he was at Stateville, not once, but twice. No, I haven't, so I haven't not read that. No, ma'am. Yeah, well, it's, it, it's yeah, in the back it. of the book. So, okay. yeah, um, Jesus came to visit him um, back when, <clears throat> when I first started writing him, um, I, my first letter was in um, February of 1999, and then July of 1999, um, Jesus came into his cell. He said he was that he was asleep, and he woke up, and Jesus was kneeling right beside his bunk, there, um, you know, like kneeling on the floor, and mm-hmm. he he um, James Files asked him, "Why are you here?" And he said, "Because you're not a believer, and the Father sent me." and told me to tell you that I'm the only way to the Father, and I guess they talked for a little while, about seven, eight, wow. ten minutes at the most. And I said, well, what did he look like? And he said he kind of had um, shoulder-length hair, maybe a little longer. He had like a brown um, mm-hmm. like robe-type garment um, and some kind of shawl around him. Um, he said it was looked like it came out of a goodwill bag. It didn't wasn't white and glowing or anything. He said it, it just looked plain. And then I said, well, what did he do? He said, well, he was kneeling the whole time and talking to mm. me. And then he got up and he said he had other people to see. And basically one second he was there and the next second he was gone. You know, like the, mm-hmm. the bars didn't stop him. He, he <clears throat> was gone. And then wow. the second time he came to him, <clears throat> he said that he wasn't kneeling that time and he was standing there and talking to him and he said that was a shorter visit. It was like two or three minutes and basically um, he said he had kind of slipped back into his old ways and wasn't thinking the right kind of thoughts and having the right kind of heart about things. And so um, Jesus said, "Wow, Father sent me back to talk to you. Um, need to get your life in order because I'm you know, he's going to be calling you home soon. And he thought that Mm. meant that he was going to die soon, but it basically just meant we're in the last days and, you know, get your life in order. And yes, uh, I go, dude, I haven't even, I've been a Christian a long time. I've never heard Jesus come and see me, but you know, those who who believe that haven't even seen him. Right. Um, Right. This is a blessing. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you're allowed or if you feel safe to giving out your church name. Um, you don't have to if you don't want to. But um, the name of your church in Chicago, your home church. Yeah, it's a it's a non-denominational church, and I I don't mind, but they probably do. So. Um, yeah. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. We it, want it's to be, a non-denominational. Yeah, we want to use wisdom. Um, spirit-filled. Uh, God honoring, Wonderful. get people at the altar, getting their life straight with God kind of, you know, church. And he, James Files is going through the baptism classes too. And so um, after we get married, we're, he's going to get baptized. 
Mm. Wow. And you guys are working on that second book right now, correct? Or yes, uh, what you we're guys working, are working on, on yep. Wow. Yep. And maybe and when we when we um invite you back for a part two of this, um we'd we'll love to find out if um James if Mr. Files knew David Ferry, um Guy Bannister, did he know these people? You know, and um, you know, it, that would be so interesting, so fascinating. He, he, he says he knew, um, he knew of him. He said he knew of him, but um, he didn't know him, and he didn't do anything directly with him. But he did know that David Ferry guy. Man, this is so awesome. I'm telling you, um, I, I am so very honored by God, and we are so very honored here uh, at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio, that you would take the time uh, out of your busy schedule to be with us for the very first time, uh, uh, Miss Pamela J. Ray. Uh, thank you so much, Miss Ray, for taking the time to be with us tonight. Well, thanks for inviting me, and uh, I look forward to doing it again. That is so awesome. And that was world renowned author uh, Pamela J. Ray, uh, interview with history, the JFK assassination um, concerning the grassy no shooter, um, James E. Files. And God willing, maybe one day we can come to Chicago and we'll love to meet him. And or vice versa, um, but we will not put any pressure on him. Uh, we will allow the Lord to, to speak to him, to come to us. And God has a plan for you guys. And thank you so much, uh, Miss Ray. It was, again, uh, not to be redundant, a great honor to interview you tonight. And um, you have changed my life forever. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you, and God <clears throat> bless you, and God bless everybody listening. God bless you so much. And, again, that was Pamela J. Ray, author uh, of Interview with History to JFK Assassination. We just got an email coming in, uh, some more names that were was at that uh, meeting the night before uh, JFK assassination with oil man Clint Murchison, um, representatives of the media that were there uh, from ABC, CBS, uh, NBC, uh, Cliff Carter representing these um, media outlets were there. They were preparing to control the media uh, a day before wow. the JFK assassination. Uh, Cliff Carter's uh, son, Lyndon Carter, was LBJ's godson. And so that's interesting. Malcolm Wallace, uh, mm-hmm. a close JFK, uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, LBJ associate, uh, Malcolm Wallace, a, a mercenary assassin. Uh, was there as well Um, and to all of our global spiritual revolution partners we will be posting this tonight on youtube.com forward slash global spiritual revolution radio also on facebook.com forward slash global spiritual revolution radio including twitter.com forward slash uh, bishop l gators amen and uh, we are excited and and thank you so much um, and that was Miss Pamela Ray, and congratulations on your engagement. And when is when is the uh, the big date? Um, it's we <laughs> haven't set the exact day yet because we are going through our marriage class, and I I would say probably within the next say month or so we're gonna do it. But um, we just we really are waiting on the Lord about doing this the right way, so. That is so awesome. And we're, and, and we're not going to have a big fancy one, you know, like <laughs> inviting hundreds of people kind of thing. We're gonna we're gonna have something really wow. quiet and private. That is awesome. And again, uh, congratulations to you. Again, uh, last but never least, that was a world-renowned author Pamela J. Ray. Um, interview with history to JFK assassination uh, with James E. Files, the grassy no shooter. Uh, we will be calling on Miss Ray again very soon to come back. Good night, Miss Ray, and God bless you guys uh, in Jesus' okay, mighty name. Thank God you. bless you. Thank God you, ma'am. You bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. And that was, um, wow, Pamela J. Ray. Um the fiance of James E. Fowles, the grassy no shooter. Uh, interview with history, the JFK assassination. Uh, with world renowned author Pamela J. Ray, with James E. Fowles, the grassy no shooter, the shooter who took the kill shot. And um, 
Truly, it is a miracle that he is still breathing and still alive, but I believe the hand of the Lord is upon this man, or else he would be uh, singing to the 72 virgins in heaven. So anyway, uh, I just want to uh, thank God for all of you Global Spiritual Revolution partners uh, listening to the broadcast tonight um, and for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us here again on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. Listen, we need your financial help. And we are praying that you will become a global spiritual revolution partner uh, by uh, sowing into our ministry uh, at least uh, $20 a month. That's not a whole lot of money, uh, uh, believe it or not. That's, that's not a whole lot of money, uh, given the fact that all we would want uh, is for you to sow $20 once a month. Uh, Not every week, just once a month beginning right now. And when you sow $20, uh, I'm telling you, you will receive uh, the transcripts. The Lord has led me to begin to compile uh, an electronic transcript, all of the notes of our broadcast. So that way, when you become a global spiritual revolution partner of uh, sowing into our global movement, uh, at least $20 once a month per month, uh, we will send you out, email you out a transcript of the broadcast from that previous night. So that way, you can correspond with all of these notes. You can look up the notes. And I'm telling you, everything that comes out of our mouths here at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio and Media Group in New York is authentic. We uh, definitely do our research. Uh, We don't hit and miss. We don't talk um, things from the top of our head. So please, uh, so into this global movement here at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. All you have to do is go online right now. (coughs) Excuse me. I've been battling... um, a cold here for the past two, three months with the same call. So definitely keep me in your prayers. Uh, please get out your your MasterCard, your Visa card, uh, your American Express, your Discover card, and go online right now, beloved. Please go online to uh, paypal.me forward slash GSRR Media Group. Again, that's paypal.me forward slash GSRR Media Group. Now, GSRR Media Group has no dashes or spaces. PayPal.me, M-E, forward slash, capital G, capital S, capital R, capital R, Media Group. That's PayPal.me, forward slash, GSRR Media Group. Uh, when you give unto the Lord, he will give you more to give. Beloved, good measure, press down, shaking together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For whatever ye meet, the Lord shall meet it to you again. So at least $20 uh, once a month, so into our global movement so we can continue to uh, awaken uh, spiritually, psychologically, and historically awaken an unawakened generation upon this planet, the terra firma called the earth. So please, at least $20 a month, and you can give $30, dollars $50, $100, $1,000, $5,000, $10,000, dollars whatever your financial position and situation is, please, so right now, become a global spiritual revolution partner. Partner with us as we take the eternal gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ preached. Um, Twenty-some years ago, the Lord asked me a question. He said, Bishop, are you preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, or are you teaching the gospel that I preached? That was a powerful, powerful question. And I want all of you to know, here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio, we are teaching you the eternal gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ preached. All right? Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. So please, um, so into this global movement. All we're asking is at least $20 from every one of you once a month, not once a week, not once every two, three, or five days, once a month. 
And when you give that, when that, uh, whatever that specific date uh, that you begin that pledge, that's up to you. So I'm asking you, all right, to uh, pledge to sow into the global movement of Global Spiritual Revolution Radio and Media Group. Uh, I'm telling you, when you sow at paypal.me forward slash GSRR Media Group, again, paypal.me forward slash GSRR Media Group, I guarantee you when you give unto the Lord, he will give you more to give. Now, tomorrow night, we're going to have part 25 uh, Apostolic Mantra 25 of the Acts of the Apostles Summit in Conclave. We will have some new apostles on board tomorrow and tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we're going to continue the theme uh, here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio through the Acts of the Apostles Summit uh, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 4 p.m. Um, on the West Coast. Um, the Mystery of Apostolic Government, and we're going to be talking about some of these Subtopics that very few leaders want to even bring up or discuss, all right, concerning what's going on in the church today, the body of Christ today. Um, we've been talking about in the past, um, you know, homosexuals in the church, lesbians in the church. Uh, I'm telling you, we, we are battling against a society uh, that our forefathers never. Uh, dealt with. We've been talking about uh, how to handle rape in the church, uh, how to get the um, the legal um, um, you know powers that be involved. Okay, uh, we've been talking about uh, not just sexual harassment, sexual abuse, how to deal with that as pastors and leaders in the body of Christ. We talked about racism. Uh, we talked about sexism. Uh, I'm telling, we have talked about everything under the sun, and we will continue to deal with those things, which seem um, so embarrassing to be talking about. We have to, to address them. So join us tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. For we are awakening an unawakened generation in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And on next Tuesday, all right, uh, May the 1st, on next Tuesday, uh, we're going to have back with us the Honorable Dr. Uh, Stephen Pigeon. Praise God. All the way from Seattle, Washington, he is the founder and the president of the Suffer Publishing Group, LLC in Eureka, Montana. Uh, Dr. Pigeon and I have been um, discussing and matriculating through a series of interviews, and now we're we are we've been dealing with a new series uh, entitled uh, "Exposing the Global System of the Serpent Sect." S E C T. Again, expo exposing. Exposing the global system of the serpent sect. You will not want to miss that broadcast. All right. Now, last night's broadcast, excuse me, was so powerful, and uh, and I'm telling you, and tonight's broadcast was just as powerful. When we uh, upload this on YouTube tonight, I want you to share. You have my permission. To all of our Global Spiritual Revolution partners, you have my permission to download these broadcasts and to share them with every single person upon the face of this earth. So I just want you to know, I've been getting a plethora of emails. Uh, Bishop, is it okay for us to download your broadcasts and to share them uh, with fan, friends and family? Yes, I'm giving you my permission, 100% permission, to download uh, some uh, all of these broadcasts and so and brought and download them not just to your YouTube channel but to many other YouTube channels so that way people can gain access to the global movement that is transforming, transferring, and transliterating the mindset and the thinking of each and every individual upon this face uh, upon the face of this earth through global spiritual revolution radio and media group not only are we on uh, awakening 
the uh, unawakened, unawakened generation uh, here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. But it is our desire and our global mandate as well to help you to come out of the mindset of an enslaved person in this global matrix called the deep state. It is our job and responsibility here at GSR, GSRR Media Group here in New York to not only to awaken you, okay, out of uh, your uh, dead state <laughs> spiritually, psychologically, uh, historically, to, uh, to awaken an unawakened generation, but also our goal and mandate is to help pull you out of this global international matrix called the Illuminati, the deep state, all right? The Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, a Rothschild influence. Our job and responsibility is to uh, awaken an unawakened generation and to unslave an enslaved generation. Did you catch that? Our responsibility here at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio is not only to awaken an unawakened generation, but our global mandate as well is to uh, unslave an enslaved mind here in the 21st century. And here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio, we are heard all over the world. And if you have a loved one who is not yet awakened, please bring them to Global Spiritual Revolution Radio on YouTube. If you have a loved one uh, in or out of the church uh, who is not only uh, unawakened, but also they have a slave mentality, I guarantee you when you bring them, to the YouTube channel here at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio on youtube.com forward slash Global Spiritual Revolution Radio or just type in Global Spiritual Revolution Radio on YouTube. I guarantee you when they hear the eternal gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ preached, when they hear knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and truth that they have never heard before, I guarantee you they will be transformed, transferred, and transliterated in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you guys. Go on to paypal.me forward slash GSRR Media Group, all right? And we will also be putting up that PayPal link uh, once we put up and upload the broadcast tonight. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, paypal.me forward slash GSRR Media Group. God bless you guys. Uh, in Jesus' mighty name, and we will see you on tomorrow night uh, here uh, with uh, part 25, Apostolic Mantra 25 of the Acts of the Apostles Summit and Conclave here and only here on Global uh, Spiritual Revolution Radio. Good night in Jesus' mighty name. <laughs>
clean food right to your office or door or porch or backyard or front yard or apartment or dorm or castle or shop or work site or wherever Panera delivers for lunch, dinner and everywhere in between. Click the banner to order or visit PaneraBread.com. Participating locations only. Panera. Food as it should be.